Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 261. It's February of 2022, and this is kind of a special episode, particularly around here, because it's our 15th anniversary. (laughs) I can't believe it. Wow, 15 years ago, uh, we started the podcast here, and um, it actually was an idea that came to me standing at a family history library one day, and I was looking at a little item I had shared with the librarian, kind of the the head reference person there, and they posted it on the bulletin board. And I looked at it and I thought, that's great. But boy, I sure would love to be able to share that with more people. So I've been looking for my kind of global bulletin board for a long time. Now that was back in 2007. and, And shortly after that happened, my kids gave me an iPod and I discovered podcasts. Well, I didn't discover podcasts. Podcasts had actually been discovered about a year and a half prior, uh, or or created, I should say. Uh, They basically came into an existence. So it was the wild west of podcasting. Very few people were doing it. Certainly none of the big names that you hear about these days across podcasting. But I thought that could be a bulletin board because I think anybody with uh, an iPod It was iPods back then before we really even had our iPhones. If you had an MP3 player, you could listen to a podcast. And uh, so I binge listened to somebody who had a podcast about podcasting. And very quickly, I think within about a month, got my first episode up. And I've been doing it continuously ever since. Having a blast. I know there are some of you out there who have actually listened since the beginning. (laughs) I really appreciate it. And um, certainly, we've come a long way since then. But the the goal is still the same, to have a global bulletin board, to post ideas, things that might help you find the genealogy gems that you're looking for. And today, I think we'll be able to help you with that if you've got some German ancestry, and a lot of people do. You know, researching ancestors in another country, I know it can be a little bit daunting, um, we have lots of challenges we face. We, there's foreign language. There's the fact that the boundaries moved around quite a bit. There's spelling variations over the decades and centuries. And that, of course, is certainly true for German genealogy. So if by chance you're new to German genealogy or research, or perhaps your research stalled a while back and you kind of went another direction and you're excited about maybe coming back to it and seeing what's fresh and what's new and seeing if you can breathe some new life into it. I think we're going to be able to help you with that today because I have a uh, fantastic guest. Uh, She's a translator, a German translator, an author, a German handwriting expert. Her name is Catherine Schoberg. And uh, Catherine's going to be sharing with us 10 top tips for beginning German genealogy, but I would really describe it even more so as for reinvigorating your German genealogy research, because as we know, new content gets added to certainly the web every day. There are probably websites out there. I think she will probably be mentioning a couple of them that maybe you aren't familiar with or haven't heard of or just lost track of. So Let's breathe some new life back into our German research. And this audio comes to you from an Elevenses with Lisa episode that's very popular on my Genealogy Gems YouTube channel. It was episode 52. And you can watch that for free as well from the show notes. Um, So that video is staying up available to everybody on our website and on the YouTube channel. But um, I know many of you are on the go. There's not a lot of time to necessarily sit down and watch a video. Or maybe you watched it and you could use a refresher. We're going to bring that really meaty content to your ears. And we're going to do it right now. Enjoy 10 top tips for German genealogy. The International German Genealogy Conference is being held once again this year, and one of the featured speakers is Catherine Schober. Now, she's a German-English translator specializing in old German handwriting, and she's also the author of the book, The Magic of German Church Records and Tips and Tricks of Deciphering German Handwriting. And 
she's a busy lady because she's also the creator of the online course, Reading the Old German Handwriting. And she's here today to give us her top 10 things that you got to know for getting started in beginning German genealogy. Welcome to the show, Katie. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Lots of folks have German ancestry, don't they? For sure. Yeah. Here in the very, US. very many. And I'm I'm here in St. Louis, and St. Louis is definitely a very German town. And I know there's a lot of other states that have very heavy German populations as well. Exactly. And here in Texas as well. Well, all right. So you've got 10 top tips to help folks get started. What's the first thing they need to do? The first thing they need to do is to start with what they know. So there are so many people who get really excited saying, oh no, I have German ancestry and they've heard it their whole lives and they want to go start looking in Germany or Austria or Switzerland. But there's so many people that have the same name. So you might have hundreds of Johann Schmitz in Germany. And so before you go waste all that time looking for a Johann Schmidt that might not be yours, you really want to start with yourself and then with your parents, and then with your grandparents, and document each and every level so you have that base research done first before you go over to Germany and start researching the wrong person. It's really the fundamentals of just good genealogy research, isn't it? It's, it's starting with what you know, and I think people so often are surprised they might know more than they think, or if they just take a couple seconds to talk to some folks in the immediate family, stories start popping up. Exactly. And that was going to be my next tip, actually, is how awesome. can you, what what, ha what happens if you get as far as you know, if you only know up to your grandparents and you don't know those great grandparents. And that's when you want to go talk to your oldest living family member, because, you know, those great aunts and uncles or grandparents or even older siblings might know more than you do. And just sitting down with them and interviewing them, one, can give you so much information. And two, it's, it's really fun. I, I know I interviewed my own grandmother a few years ago and she's turning 90 in a few weeks and <sighs> just hearing the stories that I would never have heard if I hadn't sat down and actually talked with her. It was just an amazing experience. So you're saying there's a lot we can do here in America. What kinds of other things should we be hunting for here on this side of the pond? Yes, there's so much that you can find here. So before you cross the pond, you want to have that name of your ancestor. So that Johann Schmidt, uh, you want to have a date connected with him or her, so a birth date, a death date, a marriage date, which will help you to really know that you are looking for the right Johan and not somebody else. And you want to have a town connected with him. So having that town and that date will really help to narrow down that you are looking for your own ancestor. So how can you find that in America? Um, one of my favorite things for to tell people is to look for photographs. Um, a lot of times people will have old photographs in their attics or basements, or maybe a family member will have a lot of old photos. And a lot of times on those photos, there will be little notes written on the back, or maybe the name of a studio where it was taken in Germany. And that can be a great clue. Um, besides photographs, family Bibles. Um, a lot of times family Bibles had incredible genealogical lists written in the front cover with names and dates and towns. So those are really fun and exciting that people might just have laying around their house. Um, if you don't, if you're not as lucky to have all that treasure trove of information at your house, you can look for census records. A lot of times American census records will have the name of the German town listed. Um, church records, so like your local town church where your ancestor might have lived will often have their town of origin listed. Uh, passenger list, if they came over on a certain, a certain ship, and if you can get record of that list or at their port of, port of entry or something else, that might have a town. And then one of my other favorites is newspapers. Um, about a year ago, I discovered newspapers.com, and I was, I was wondering why I hadn't discovered this before. It is so fun. And you can find great stories about your ancestors here in America. And a lot of times, if it mentions your ancestor, it may have... Johann came from Rosenheim, Germany, and now lives in the blah, 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 St. Louis. So just looking at all those American sources can really be a big help in finding your town. Oh, wow. Those are all great ideas. Um, I, I love your comment about the photos because 
Um, most of us will have maybe just a little something, you know, that's either handed down or maybe we find it online, you know, through connections with other aunts, uh, cousins. One of the things I did not too long ago was I have an album that my great grandmother brought from Germany in 1910. Oh, amazing. Yeah. And it has a lot of photos. She didn't make notations on it. But one of the things uh. I did was your idea about the photographers was I went into Google Earth and I just started oh, searching right. for every photographer studio location. And I just started plotting them on the map. And it was amazing. It kind of gave me this whole map or path of, of the families, both her family and the family she married into. And I could that's really amazing. Uh, something you, yeah. Yeah, something you might not have had otherwise. So that's a really, yeah, I think that's just such an easy way to find a town or at least a general area for where your ancestor could have been. Exactly. Just to zero in on that area. And then you can dig into records. Okay, so number one, the top tip number one was to, of course, start with what you know and write it all down. And uh, then you said that number two was we've got some homework to do here in <laughs> right. the States or wherever people live uh, before they try to get into the German records. <clears throat> so uh, what is number three? Number three is to make sure you actually have the correct German town. So just like here in America, we have multiple towns with the same name. I think there's actually a Springfield in every single state in America. <laughs> Um, that's the same for in Germany or Austria or Switzerland. There's going to be multiple, maybe dozens of towns sometimes with the exact same name. So you want to make sure that you don't just know the name of that specific town, but the actual state where the town was in. So again, you don't waste time looking in Northern Germany when your ancestor actually comes from Southern Germany. So one of my favorite way websites to look at this is the website Myers Gazetteer. And for those of you just starting out, you may not be aware, but Myers Gazetteer is a wonderful website that has hundreds of thousands of towns in Germany listed um, as Germany was before World War I. So even if your ancestor is in present-day Poland or France or Czech Republic, your town will still be on there, and it will give you the different levels of administration, um, so telling you that district and that state. It also gives you a map, and one of my favorite things to do is you can click on the map, and uh, the map that is shown is a regular modern-day Google, uh, Google map, but if you click on it, it changes to the historical version of the map. And so you can see an actual historical with the old names and things like that. Oh, I love that. Gosh, that and that is so key. Um, my great grandmother was from Grunwald. Turns out there were a couple of them. <laughs> and the right. was it was the only way to figure it out. Um, and I kind of loved once you kind of find it there, you could also go over to davidrumsey.com and do a quick search on it. And they have more old maps too. So it and just Definitely. for a second, because I know that boundaries changed a lot. And this can take people by surprise because it's so much more so in Germany than it might be here in the States. Will you just touch on right. that just for a second? Sure. So what we think of as modern day Germany didn't actually come until much later. So Germany used to be different kingdoms and duchies and princedoms and things like principalities, I guess is the right yeah. word. <laughs> um, and, um, so and it wasn't unified um, as an empire until until 1871. So like the, mm -hmm. the German Empire came about in 1871. Um, and before that, it was really, you know, just divided up. So the borders were constantly changing. They changed again after uh, World War One and World War II. Um, I know uh, James Beidler, one of the co-chairs of the German Genealogy Conference, he has an amazing book called The Historical mm -hmm. Atlas of Germany. And it's, it has a, a bunch of very interesting maps and you can see how the borders changed throughout the years and look at the different decades and the different centuries and kind of see how that affected where your ancestor might have lived and what jurisdiction they were under. Right. Super important. Jim is great. He's a good friend. And I will have a link in the show notes for this episode. And we have a video um, that Jim did for us a couple of years ago at the Genealogy Gems booth. I think it was at Roots Tech and talks oh, about cool. uh, German genealogy as well. Okay, so and then I have here number four, you say that uh, we got to find out which records are available. Now that we've figured out which town, we've got to uh, jump into the records and give us hope. Are there records out there? <laughs> 
Hopefully, yeah. I know there's different yeah. different people will have different amounts of luck depending on their town and where their ancestor is from and the the century they're looking in. But of course, there are records out there. And the Family Search Library catalog is a great place to start. If you can go to the website, which I think you'll link to um, mm -hmm. in the notes, and you can type in your town, and it will give you a list of different records. So maybe there's church records available. Uh, maybe there's an address book for your specific town, which can be a great resource. Um, vital records, emigration records. A lot of times in Germany, people needed permission to leave, to, em to emigrate. Um, mm -hmm. I translated a lot of those um, actually, and you can get a lot of great genealogical information in those permission to leave documents. So, if you go to the Family Search catalog, it will give you kind of a list of what you might start looking for and just give you an idea of how you can jump in. Oh boy, I got to add that to my list. <laughs> I got address books last year. I think I saw a bunch of them coming up on Ancestry.com. Didn't know they had the permission documents. That's fascinating. Mm, and these are in German. Yeah. Right. <laughs> They're in German. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of times there was mandatory military service. So these will say right. if your ancestor co had completed his military service or if he was exempt um, and he would need to have something listed to that to be allowed to leave. Um, a lot of times they'll say who they were emigrating with. If this person was taking minor children, a wife, um, it'll list their names and birth dates sometimes. It will list occupations. So these are really, really great resources if you can find them. Do you by chance know are they digitized at Family Search or do we need to? Um, Ooh, I don't know them? at Family Search. I, th okay. I mean, I've translated a lot of them and people send them to me yeah. to download. So I'm not sure how they got them. And I know Family Search has kind of changed a lot of their rules over the last yes. couple of years. So I ran into a couple of roadblocks recently. Okay, well, we'll make a list. I'm, a, I'm making my list. I've got to go check those out and see if I can find anything as well. But it's just so interesting to know that that's available. All right, sit tight, because coming up in just a moment is our next top tip. But first, this message from our wonderful sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by MyHeritage, a global discovery platform enjoyed by 110 million people worldwide. MyHeritage has it all and offers a full service experience that bridges your past, present and future. The MyHeritage DNA kit reveals your ethnic origins and finds your new relatives based on shared DNA. It's popular all over the world, and their constantly growing DNA database means that more matches to new relatives are just around the corner. You'll receive a percentage breakdown of your ethnic origins from 42 supported regions and weekly email updates as new DNA matches are found. It's also the leading DNA service for anyone with European origins. Make the most of your DNA results with a MyHeritage subscription and access advanced tools for genetic genealogy, like the theory of family relativity, autoclusters, shared ancestral places, and much more. Order your kit today at myheritage.com slash DNA. Already taken a DNA test with another service? Upload your DNA data to MyHeritage for free to receive DNA matches and access new discoveries. That's myheritage.com slash DNA. All right, let's jump back in and go to our next German genealogy top tip. What's number five? In our right. Um, yeah, let me talk about the wiki real quick because we haven't oh, gotten yeah. to that too much. Oh, we can, uh, we can talk about this with number five too. So my mm -hmm. number five was um, take advantage of the how-to guides on the family search wiki and the word list. And then everything else. So this family search wiki for anyone who doesn't know is just an amazing wealth of information on all kinds of genealogy. Um, so if you're doing German, you can go to the German genealogy family search wiki. They'll have how to guides on how to work with um, address books, how to work with church records, how to work with passenger lists, um, pretty much anything and everything. And it's kind of like you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You know, they have done so much work for us and there's so much information there. If you just go to their website before you start and kind of scroll through it, um, just kind of really gives you a good idea of what's out there and how you can work with it. I love that. Boy, that should be everybody's mantra. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> I remember somebody saying that to me when, back when I was a kid and I went into the family history library for the first time and they said, oh, honey, people have compiled genealogies. Let's start there and see if anybody's <laughs> done anything first. So right, fant exactly. that's fantastic. 
Okay. So yeah, yes, and that's the, actually, a, I was going to say, that's actually, um, um, I was reaching out to my fellow conference committee members to see if they had any good German genealogy tips for me to add. And one of them, Nancy Myers said, she always likes to go to Ancestry or Family Search and go to those family trees on there and see what other people have contributed who are also researching the same line. So of course you do want to be careful and you want to double check that they've actually right accurately done their homework and not just <laughs> automatically assume that what they've posted is correct, but it can at least kind of get you in the right direction. So you're not starting from scratch when other people have already kind of done that work for you. Yeah. And it gives you a clue. At least you can then go do it and check it yourself, but you know that that's right. a possibility that somebody has it on there. Okay. Definitely. So yeah, you mentioned that number five was taking advantage of family search the wiki, the how-to guides. And that's, Katie, those are really compiled by people who are experts over at the Family Search, uh, Family History Library. So, I mean, For that's sure. really good stuff. All and right. it's really amazing because th they have um, different regions. So you can go to the wiki and you can find your specific region and it will tell you how to research for that region. So it will say, oh, these are how you research with the Bavarian address books. And it will kind of walk you through. So it's really very detailed and you can find it for exactly your ancestors area where they lived. Yeah, that great point. It, gosh, it's always so important. I think it's even more so with German that um, you got to really get familiar, don't you, with the area, mm -hmm. the region, the history. I mean, if if you don't take a moment to, to pause and really get yourself up to speed, then you have to work twice as hard once you look at records, don't you? Right. Yeah. And you really hit the nail on the head. Understanding the history is also so important. Understanding kind of why your ancestor might have uh, emigrated at the time they did and understanding, like we said before, those boundaries. And that can really help you to find, you know, find more information if you knew what the history was at the time. So really, the more you can know before you start, it's going to make your research so much easier. All right. Well, I think number six is going to fall right there in your your expertise. <laughs> what? Tell us your sixth tip. Exactly. So my sixth tip is um, you need to familiarize yourself with the old German handwriting. So this is a huge thing that really overwhelms a lot of people. Um, if you're not familiar with German genealogy research, uh, you might not know that these records are written in an old type of handwriting that is not used anymore in Germany today. So I'm actually married to um, a native German speaker, an Austrian, and he cannot read this old writing. So he's no help to me if I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to decipher. <laughs> you can maybe recognize, you know, one to two words, but it's really, it's a I say this because it's just to show you it's completely different. Um, and I actually started to learn it because his grandmother learned it in school. So it's really that generation. She's 87. And she still learned it in school, but they're really the last people who can read it, who learn to read it, who aren't doing it as a hobby nowadays. You know, you're going to get your few people who are into research who might know it, but as a, the general population no longer knows it. So that can be really scary for people who are researching their genealogy. It's not not only a foreign language, but it's a totally different type of handwriting too. So, um, but you can do it. That's what I always like to tell people. I taught myself, so it's possible to learn it for sure. And you teach a lot of people about handwriting. I know we've had you uh, writing on our blog a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Tell folks about uh, the course that you offer, because I, I looked at it and used it. And wow, what a difference just to get familiar with some of the key German words, but more importantly, how they look in the writing, because it is very different. Right. So yeah, so about two years ago, I decided um, to make an online course for people who are wanting to learn it because I had so many clients really interested in actually doing it themselves and having the fun of deciphering the script and discovering their ancestors. So I broke it down into three sections. And the first section teaches you kind of just goes through the alphabet and teaches you how to recognize A, B, C, etc. And then the second section gets you familiar with all the German genealogical words you'll need to know, like birth and death and church records and things like that and recognizing those in the script. And then the third section is, I think, the most fun. It really delves into those records and gives you sample church records, sample vital records, sample letters, and then gives you the answers too. Because when I was learning, that was really hard for me. Um, I'd transcribe and transcribe, but then had nobody to tell me 
if I was right or wrong. So it's really nice to have a way to check your work. Uh, the whole course has different flashcards and matching games and tests and quizzes. And I tried to make it fun for people and you get lifetime access to it. So you can do it, you know, if you take a break from your genealogy, you can stop and do it again in a year or six months. And people have loved it so far. And I, I have fun because I really enjoy teaching. So it's fun to get to see people's progress. And, and I think we have a special deal for people on your... Yeah show see. i think you we have a coupon code okay so the coupon code is gems g-e-m-s in all caps that'll get you 10 percent off of katie's course i can vouch for it it was so much fun and also um like you said really nice to see the answers i could find little bits yeah. and pieces i remember kind of scrapping around the internet looking for little bits and pieces trying to decipher a word or or some handwriting and but it's it wasn't cohesive. That's almost, it just takes too much time to do that. So sitting down with the course and then having you show me what I would really expect to see in a document mm -hmm. and then making yeah. sure that I was interpreting it correctly based on what I'd learned, it was invaluable. What's the website? Where do they go to use this coupon oh. code if they'd like to try the, the handwriting course? It is german-handwriting.teachable.com. So german-handwriting.teachable.com. And you have 30 days to try it out. But I mean, we have hundreds of students and we just started a Facebook community and that's been really fun. So it's, I love it. And I love the handwriting. So it's nice to have fellow people who are so passionate about it as well. It's fascinating. Okay. Well, I'll have a link in the video description and also in our show notes page. You know, it gets me thinking, Katie, about cursive writing. You know, here in the States, there seems like they're just it's out the window with the kids not learning the cursive. And that's really one of the handwriting is one of the most important links to history, isn't it? I've really, yeah, I've thought about that too. And I still learned cursive in school and I still write when I write in my journal, I write in cursive, but you know, I translate journals and diaries all the time. And so I think as someone, you know, 200 years from now going to be reading my journal about the pandemic <laughs> and cursive and, yes. and, you know, having no idea what it says because no one can read the, the old American handwriting anymore. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, it has something to say for, uh, just stick with what we, <laughs> what we know, making sure right. that people can have access to their history. Well, it's wonderful that you're helping people do that with German records. All right, so that was number six. Familiarize yourself with the old German handwriting. It really is key. Another top tip is coming up right after this. Today's episode is sponsored by newspapers.com, the largest online newspaper archive. Newspapers.com makes it easier than ever to find your family's story with more than a half a billion digitized newspaper pages from the 1690s to today. Did your dad win a big game in high school? Did your great grandma win a bake off? Whether it's a familiar family story or a new discovery, the possibilities for what you might find on newspapers.com are endless. The simple to use tools and search features make it easy to discover, save and share the stories that connect you with the past. Search for obituaries, marriage announcements, birth announcements, photos and more in papers from across the United States, the UK, Canada, and beyond, stretching back three centuries. And for listeners of this podcast, newspapers.com is offering 20% off a subscription. So you can start exploring today. Just use the code genealogy gems, altogether, no spaces, genealogy gems at checkout. That's code genealogy gems to get 20% off today at newspapers.com. All right, let's jump back in and go to our next German genealogy top tip. And what's number seven? So number seven is something I've kind of alluded to is church records. You want to use German church records in your research. Um, so before, like I mentioned, Germany was unified in 1871. And before that, it was the churches who kept track of people's births, marriages, and deaths rather than the government. So you really want to turn to the local churches to find information on your ancestors' lives. And there's some great websites where you can do that. So there's, the, of course, the common ones like Family Search and Ancestry. Um, a relatively new one is Archeon. So it's A-R-C-H-I-O-N dot D-E. And that's um, a German website. 
and it's for Protestant parishes. So they've, over the last couple of years, have really been working to digitize hundreds of thousands of German Protestant records, and they're still going. So every, every month they publish new churches that they've digitized. And I know my clients who have used it have really had great luck with it and really loved it. And so that you'll okay. see either Katholisch, which is Catholic, Right. Or uh, so Catholic, like Catholic, <laughs> and uh, Evangelical, uh, Evangelish, actually, which is um, Protestant. Yeah. Or you I might see, see some people have some people have Jewish, uh, some people mm -hmm. have Evangelical Lutheran, but Protestant and Catholic. So Evangelish and Catholic will be the two main ones that you'll probably see. Yeah. I've been and then a if lot you have of the Lutheran. <laughs> Yeah, sure. A lot of people have. Yeah. And then if you have Austrian ancestors, um, there's another great website. So Archeon is actually paid. It's subscription based and you can, I think it's on a monthly basis. So you can kind of pick the amount of time that you want to have access to it. Um, but matricula is, um, it, that one's free and that's mainly Austrian, but they've started to add different areas um, for Eastern Europe, I think some Southern German. So it's worth checking out if your ancestors area is on there and they're continuing to add more areas as well. Fantastic. So the church records were looking for birth, marriage, death, and um, they really, the ones at least I ran into have been so meticulous. I mean, it's just, uh, there's kind of a reputation in, in, for Germans who are very meticulous and thorough. And I yes. certainly found that myself in, in so, records. Is that something typical? Yes. Like, I believe me, I live with one. So that's definitely, <laughs> definitely true. <laughs> um, but no, that's very, that's, I mean, for us as genealogists, that's wonderful because, um, yeah, you get so much information on uh, the time of birth. Even they were born at seven o'clock in the morning in this uh, location. And this person was the pastor and this person was the midwife. And a lot of times you'll get very, I mean, more often than not, you'll get the occupation of the parents, which is very cool to see. Mm -hmm. um, what my clients love especially is if there's a little note or something scribbled at yeah. the bottom of the record, because that's when you get the juicy details about, you know, maybe it was an illegitimate birth and they got married, you know, a year later, or maybe your ancestor had a twin who was stillborn. Um, mm -hmm. I had one client who found out her ancestor was worked at the church. And so they rang the bells for him so many times when he died. Oh. And so there's just a lot of really good information on there. I love looking at all the, the witnesses. Uh, certainly, yes. I know in my family, there was such interconnectedness. Those witnesses were just as valuable as the people I was researching because kind of built out my families. Um, okay, Definitely. so church records is number seven. What's your top tip for number eight? So number eight is to use vital records. So I mentioned that the churches were the, uh, the ones who kept track of people's birth, marriages, and deaths before Germany was unified. But after that, so it took a couple years, but after 1876, Germany as a whole, um, the government began keeping track of these birth, marriages, and deaths. And you might, if your ancestor comes from a certain region in Germany, you might get lucky and find these records beforehand. I know in the areas where Napoleon had been, he brought in this record keeping system. So if your ancestor came from a certain region, you might get this before, but overall it was after 1876. And these forms I love because they are half printed text and half of the old handwriting. So they're not as scary as the church records. <laughs> you know, you get kind of that printed that makes it a little easier to read and they're always the same format. So once you've translated one, you kind of get an idea of what to expect and what to look for. And just like church records, these give you the names, the dates, the occupations, the witnesses, um, sometimes a little extra information. It gives you the parents so you can go a generation back. Um, and these are great. I, I, li I really like working with those records. And will we be able to find some of these online by chance from home? Yeah, so definitely. Um, I think Ancestry is the best place to find these. They, you can find them on Family Search, but most of my clients find these ones on Ancestry. Um, of course, not everything is digitized, but if you can't find it, um, you can write to the registry office in your German town. Um, so that word is Standesamt. Um, it's S T A N D, so like stand and then E-S-A-M-T, Standesamt, and you can write um, 
to the to that registry office and say, do you have any records for my ancestor? Um, and if anyone wants, I have a, a specific request form in German. So if any of your listeners would want that, they can feel free to email me and I can just pass that on to them. But all hope is not lost if you cannot find them online. Oh, that's, we like that. Like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We like that. All right. Uh, okay. So top tip for finding German ancestors, number nine. Number nine is also one. I have a lot of favorites, apparently, but I, <laughs> as a translator, I like number nine. Um, it's um, There are going to be creative spellings of your ancestor's name, uh, maybe your ancestor's town. Spelling was not standardized in the German language until a lot later than you think. I think the late... Um, 18th, early 19th century, or sorry, late 19th, early 20th century. And that means that a lot of people uh, wrote words as they sounded to their own ears. So if your ancestor was writing his name, he might have written it one way. But if a scribe was writing his name, he might have written it another way. And um, people can get overwhelmed. They can think, well, how am I supposed to know all the possible ways? But there are kind of common mistakes that people that people made. Um, and I actually have a blog post all about it. It's called Think Like a German, Spelling Variations <laughs> in German Documents. Um, because there's four letters that um, very often get switched with each other. Uh, one of the most common is B and P. Um, because in, in German, even today, those sounds sound very similar to their ears. Um, I used to live in Austria and my maiden name is Portnoy, P-O-R-T-N-O-Y. And I remember going to a bookstore and I had to order a book and give them my name to mail it to me when, when it was ready. And Portnoy is not a common, common German name. So <laughs> he was like, um, he was like, Portnoy, is that with a hard B or a soft P? And I was like, I had no idea what he was talking about. And I was like, you know, it's, it's not hard or soft. It's just a pup. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I tell that story because they have adjectives to differentiate the letters because they sound so similar to them. So they say hard and soft um, even today. So if you think back to hundreds of years ago, people mixed up those B's and P's all the time. Um, and there's a few more pairs as well. So if you know those couple pairs that always get swapped out for each other, you can look for different variations of your ancestor's name. Yeah, I can attest to that. My great grandfather was Gustav, Gustav, mm -hmm. Gustav. Gustav. Mm -hmm. Gustav. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's no, the way yeah. it's written, you know. <laughs> right. And, yeah. It just became Gus in, in America, which made it a lot easier. A lot easier. That works too. Yeah. So. You have a blog post. We'll have a link for that. Any other websites that are going to help us out with that? Yeah, there's one of a uh, really good website. It's called Geogen. It's a geogen.stopel.net. Maybe I think it'd be better if you link, <laughs> we link to it rather yeah. than me spelling it out. Um, but this is a great website for looking up your last name. So I transcribe so many last names in my work. And there's last names are hard because there's no dictionary to say, is this really a word or not? But Geogen works as a great way to kind of double check your last name transcription. So you can type your name as you think it is into this website, and it will show you where instances of that last name occur in Germany. So if you type in your last name, let's say Schmidt, and it appears in northern Germany, but your ancestors only come from southern Germany, you might want to go back and see did I read that handwriting correctly? Did I check that last name correctly? Because that last name doesn't exist in Southern Germany. Or if you get no results whatsoever, you know, then you, you want to go back and check that handwriting. So I, I, I use this kind of as a way to kind of double check any last name transcription and see if I'm right. Oh, how great. How interesting. Okay, so that was the geogen.stopel. Yes, I will have that in yeah, our exactly. show notes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, not so. the best name. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's recap before we get to number 10. Start with uh, what you know was number one. Two was looking for resources in America. And we've got some uh, things that she's mentioned for that. And then number three was rec uh, records in Germany at the local level using that Myers ga uh, gas, which is so important. Number four was finding out what records are available for your specific town. So that's Family Search and Family Search Wiki. 
which takes us to number five, which is really using the wiki to your best advantage, those how-to guides. Number six, the the fun one, I think, which is uh, getting yourself really familiar with the old German handwriting, which, of course, Katie can help you with. Um, Using church records, several websites we've talked about there. Vital records, of course, which is more at the um, government-generated records. And number nine, we got those creative spellings, which brings us to number 10 in your top 10 list. Number 10. Yes. And you actually gave a clue to it earlier. You said, um, I always like to look at the witnesses on my ancestor's record. And so that is what number 10 is. It is to use the fan club principle. And this is one of the first things I learned in genealogy. The fan club stands for friends or family and then associates and neighbors. And that means if you get stuck and you cannot find anything else on your ancestors line, you're just hitting brick walls and you can't go any farther, start to look for those people in the witnesses columns, those friends or relatives of your ancestor. Um, Look for who they might have transferred land to. Look for confirmation sponsors and then start to research those people. Because if these people were, uh, were witnesses for your ancestors, perhaps your ancestor was a witness for them. And then in looking at their record, you might be able to find some more information on your ancestor that might not have been listed on uh, records for them directly. And, and that's it. That's the power of it is that it really yeah. expands how much available uh, material you have to work with because now you're moving into exactly. other books. and. I was thinking about the address books. You know, it's interesting to see who mm-hmm. else is living nearby, you know, in the address right. books. There's yeah, so that's true. Many... Those neighbors were. Yeah, there's so much potential for, for tracking those down. These are all great. Definitely. And I think that they help the genealogists generally, many of them do, because they're just really good standard genealogical practice. But I can see really the the power that they have of being applied to German research as well. Gosh, this is fantastic. Katie Schober, I appreciate of course. it. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad to get to talk with you and glad to be here. Thank you for joining me for Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 261. And you will find the show notes for this episode over at our website, uh, genealogygems.com or lisalouisecook.com. They take you to the same place. And uh, again, this is episode 261. So that's what what you're looking for under Genealogy Gems podcast. And I'd love to know uh, your thoughts. uh, If there's a favorite website that you have come across in your German genealogy uh, search, or perhaps a favorite reference book, some kind of strategy or collection that has really made a difference for you. Uh, do share it in the comment section on the show notes page. Boy, that just helps everybody. And we're all in the same research boat. So I encourage you to do that. And you'll find links to everything that Katie talked about in this episode as well. So it's all right there for you. If you're a premium member, and I certainly hope you're part of our Genealogy Gems premium family, um, go to the resources section on the show notes page, and you can download the ad free version of the show notes. It's a super convenient, searchable PDF handout with everything that's included in the show notes for you for your reference and uh, use. And if you'd like to learn how to become a premium member, we certainly hope you'll join us. Head over to our website, genealogygems.com and uh, click on premium. You'll see a button there, become a premium member. Join us and get access to all of the premium content all year long. All right, well, I've got to get busy on the next 15 years of this podcast. So until next time, thank you so much for listening, my friend. I'll talk to you soon.